So we have next, we have Sarah Kerr and Megan Allen, and they're going to be talking about helping fleets succeed with electric vehicles. All right, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, the first thing is you may have gotten one of these on your way in. Uh, probably this was uh, mentioned in the last session if you were here. Uh, so we want to hear from you. What should we do next? Uh, so as if you have any ideas right now or as we talk through what we have today, just jot down your ideas and let us know how we can improve the product for you. And you can drop them uh, on your way out or even just come by the EV kiosk and if you have an idea later and just drop it off. Mike is a guy if you need a form. <laughs> OK, awesome. All right, I want to hear from you now. Show of hands. For the customers in the room, do you have any electric vehicles today? Awesome. Uh, for resellers, do you have any customers with EVs? Same question for you, yeah, awesome. Uh, what about greater than 5% of your fleet? Electric. Fewer hands. Awesome, but still some. That's really good. Uh, and what about your plans? Do you have any plans to grow that fleet of EVs? More than 5% in five years? Yeah? Okay, great. That's really great to see. All right, so when we embarked on the journey to support electric vehicles in Geotab, there was kind of three things we were thinking about. First is Electric vehicles are vehicles. At the end of the day, they should be treated as first-class citizens in your fleet. We should be getting data off of them like any other. Uh, they should be integrated in existing reports and features. Next is EV data. Should be as rich as conventional vehicles. Uh, so today, a lot of electric vehicle data, originally you couldn't get a lot of information. We sought out to make sure that we could get charging information alongside fill-up information electric energy consumption alongside fuel energy consumption, uh, state of charge of the battery alongside fuel level, et cetera. Next is the EV features and reports that we make sure we add into the product really answer your top questions. And that's why those, answering those forms is so important, but more importantly, just having conversations with the product management uh, team, such as myself or Hanny. Uh, we really want to hear from you. What can we do to, to make the product better for you? And those, con those conversations continue as we evolve the product. Underlying all of this, though, is our commitment. Uh, Geotab, we are very much committed to supporting your fleet from zero to 100% electric. OK, one thing to note about EV data access. It's not necessarily easy. Unfortunately, EVs do not follow mandatory data standards like fuel cars would. Uh, but luckily for us, uh, 2020 uh, marks the 10th anniversary of the Fleet Karma team that was acquired by Geotab of doing this. Uh, so we have a team, strong team, that can do this. And 2020, our big focus, uh, more than anything else, is to roll out more and more support for more models and increase our velocity. Today, we support approximately 48 uh, EV makes and models, 32 where we have full data support uh, and partial support for the others that we're going to be gradually rolling into full data support. If you want to know if your EVs are supported, there is a public reference that's linked here from the deck. All right, what about, what happened back, let's look back in 2019, what happened for EV? What do we have today? Uh, so one of the, the kind of more visual features is showing the real-time charging activity on the map. So in this view, there's two pieces of information. One of them is your battery state of charge, uh, indicated by that little battery icon and the percentage there. And the other one is a lightning bolt. In the last row, you'll see there, there's a lightning bolt next to that. That indicates whether or not your EV is actively charging. So what is that really for? It answers two core questions. Does this EV need to charge right now? And will it have enough range? So right there, you have that live view. Uh, however, this is a very versatile feature. There's so many different use cases that you can use for this, and I continue to learn more and more of them. So for example, for, uh, for delivery and service fleets, if you are questioning whether or not the EV can do the job, you can quickly look in here and take a look uh, at any point in time and have that peace of mind. Um, the next is for any fleet type. Zoom in on the location where your EVs are, char are parked. See who's charging, who's not charging, but should be. So this is good for potentially a motor pole context. 
Next thing is, if you've got more EVs and plugs, use the EV charge sort feature. You can prioritize which of the EVs that should be charging first. Flip that around and use the feature for the same thing to say, hey, this EV is ready to go. Uh, it has the most range right now. It's at 100%. Or it has enough range for the next trip if it's not there. All right, chances are, though, you're not looking at that map all the time. Uh, so that's where the notifications comes in. So the notifications today, essentially, uh, you can create custom rules to be notified about any EV activity you care about. Some of the common things are if the EV has a low charge. The EV is out and about for the day, it's driving. Uh, you can get notified if the state of charge reaches a certain lower threshold. Uh, another example is if the uh, EV is coming back into the lot with a low charge, you can use that as a plug-in reminder for your driver. It's time to plug that vehicle in. Another one is if the vehicle is not charging. Potentially the vehicle is there, but someone forgot to plug it in. Uh, potentially it's a missed charging opportunity that the driver didn't take advantage of. Or potentially there's something wrong with the charging infrastructure. But you can be notified to take action. The next one is if the EV is done charging. So I talked earlier about how there's more, sometimes more EVs uh, than plugs available. So you can time to swap that plug, the vehicle is done charging, or just say this EV is ready to go. All right, the EV charging history report. So this really tells you where, when, how much an, an electric vehicle charged. So where, first piece of information, if you even just wanna know, where are all my EVs charging? They're charging here, they're charging using public charging infrastructure, even, plan, even planning out your charging infrastructure, it's just great to have that visibility if you have more than one location. Um, how much energy, this is such a simple one. Um, when I first started, ha started having a lot of conversations with fleet managers, a lot of the questions they were getting were, you know, how much electricity are you using? And they didn't have visibility into that. Um, they didn't, the facilities, uh, people would be paying the bill, but they didn't know how much the EVs were con contributing to the building load. And actually, this is the, the, f the first key step to understanding what your charging costs are, is just having your charging energy in. And more about charging costs when uh, Megan speaks about her, ex her extensions. Uh, the next step is just troubleshooting. So what actually happened? I have the full history. So I can look back and see, like, why does this vehicle have the state of charge that it does? Did it not charge enough? Is there something wrong here? Did it not charge at all when I thought it was? Next up is looking at your electric vehicle performance. So we have the fuel and EV energy usage report. And that report really combines fuel consumption as well as electric energy consumption in one report. So it's great for when you have definitely a mixed fleet like we saw in the room today. We have your plug-in hybrids as well as your full battery electrics as well as your fuel cars. Um, here what we do is we actually present your uh, MPGE, miles per gallon equivalent, where we take the electric energy consumed convert it to the equivalent in gas using a standard EPA calculation, and just show at a glance what is your, how are your EVs performing compared to fuel cars. And if you wanna be able to kind of quickly sell the value of EV against your fuel cars, you just run this report uh, with your fuel cars. Another big one is we hear so often about how fleets first invested in plug-in hybrids, and they essentially um, were not getting plugged in. So they made a big investment, uh, they, and fleet managers don't necessarily have that visibility on whether they're getting a good return on that investment that they made. Are they just running like fuel cars and not getting plugged in? So in this report, we also calculate what is the percentage electric energy of all of the fuel being consumed. If it's low, it's a red flag for your, plug, your PHEV. If it's higher, you're probably good to go. <coughs> Next, I'm going to introduce my colleague, Megan, who is gonna talk about all the valuable extensions that her team has done with the EV data. Thanks, Sarah. So I wanted to start off by explaining the role of the EV Solutions Engineering team and what we do. So if you just looked through those features and you thought, awesome, my fleet can definitely use this, but it's only 80% of the where I need to be. So my customer or myself, I need a little bit more. We're here to build customizations that help deliver that last 20%. And we do that by taking the reports that we just covered in addition to the tools that are available on the Geotab platform. So things like the SDK and custom rules. And I'm gonna go through a couple examples of how we've used these tools to solve specific problems. 
but by no means is this all. So if you do think you've got a niche problem that's just a little bit farther than what we've covered today, uh, please reach out and talk to us. So one of the first areas that we work a lot in is capturing charging costs. So Sarah just went over what it looks like in the charging report. You can see when and where charging occurs and how much. But when we have fleets that are larger fleets, they operate across a large area, a large geographic area. And it means that when they're charging their vehicles, they can be getting electricity from several different utilities. These utilities might have different time of use structures. And then someday, someone's going to come to the fleet manager and say, how much does it cost to charge this vehicle? And it can be complicated or sometimes impossible to figure out. So the example we show here is two depots that are far enough apart that they're different utilities, but close enough apart that the same vehicle could charge at, e at each. And what we've developed is an SDK add-in that essentially allows the structure of how you pay for electricity to be input and uses the information that's available in the MyGeotab charging reports to calculate the cost to charge each vehicle. The next example is a little bit of an extension on this. So we heard in the keynotes yesterday how difficult it is when you're a fleet and you give electric vehicles to drivers to take home. We saw fleets really invest in plug-in hybrid vehicles, and they did so because of the return on investment, because it can be very inexpensive to charge vehicles overnight. In an ideal scenario, the fleet adopts a plug-in hybrid, drives throughout the day, the driver comes home, plugs in, and charges overnight when the cost of electricity is lowest. However, what we actually see happen in practice is that those drivers take home a vehicle, and they don't have a good way to get reimbursed. They do have a great way to get reimbursed from fuel. They have a corporate card, they go to the gas station, or they have a fuel card. And so they operate these plug-in hybrid vehicles purely on gasoline, and the fleet ends up paying more because they're not taking advantage of the battery and they're not taking advantage of the technology that they invested in. So we can employ a very similar solution for this as we did with the fleets that operate in two different areas, where we create a special HR clearance that can upload zones only visible to HR. And this enables us to calculate the amount of charging and the cost of charging that occurs at individual residences so that fleets can start to reimburse drivers for charging at home and start to encourage them charging at home. And that leads into the next area, and that's around EV compliance or EV best practices. A lot of the times, EVs are new, and they're in a mixed fleet. So you've got conventional vehicles and electric vehicles. And there's a lot of learning that has to happen before EV adoption becomes habit, before it becomes totally known. We know most of you, Sarah asked, you've got less than 5% or 5% EVs in your fleet. These are the types of challenges that you're going to be facing when it's not totally known that when you come back to a depot, you have to plug the vehicle in. And the cost of forgetting is that the next morning, if you have a battery electric vehicle, you can't use it. And if you have a plug-in hybrid vehicle, it means you're going to be running on fuel. And so we don't want that. We want to be able to maximize the amount of distance that you're traveling on the battery. We want to maximize the return on investment. And so alerts, like Sarah alluded to, using the real-time state of charge and putting a pretty simple rule in place to say, let's say we put a, v a zone around a specific v depot, and the vehicle enters the zone. It has a state of charge of less than 90%, and it doesn't start charging in 10 minutes send a notification to the driver, or send a text message to the supervisor who happens to be managing that depot. The alternative is that that supervisor goes out and checks every single vehicle, making sure they're still plugged in. We want to make the transition to electric vehicles simple and easy. And so while we have alerts that can prevent bad situations from happening, what we want to do is be able to identify drivers that might need a refresher on EV technology. If we think about the vehicles that we've been operating, conventional vehicles haven't changed much over the last 30 years. There's conventional wisdom with them. 
For electric vehicles, we need to start addressing if there's knowledge gaps and make that adoption easier. So we can do the mischarging activity exceptions report in addition to looking at plug-in hybrids that aren't using the battery and only running on fuel. And we can do this to think of EV compliance, but it's really opportunities for EV training. Another area we focus a lot in is grant uh, reporting. Grants often want to report on the return on investment from electric vehicles or the carbon emissions saved. So fleets take advantage of grants available in their area, but in order to do so, they have to report many different items in very specific ways. And so we look to calculate the carbon reduction, the fuel saved, or reduction in operating costs, and slice it and dice it into specific operating zones or within specific departments. So overall, I hope that I showed a, an overview of how we can take what's built into the product and expand it beyond. If you have any ideas or any questions, please don't hesitate to engage with myself or the EV Solutions Engineering team. All right, Sarah. Thanks so much, Megan. All right, so we talked about what we have today, you know, what 20, 2019 brought, but let's look ahead to 2020. Uh, so what's coming? Uh, one of the first things you may have heard of yesterday is that we are doing a Geotop integrated solution with 4GM. Luckily for us, that does include EVs. Uh, so uh, it will include 2015 plus uh, EVs. So. Uh, the Volt, Bolt, Spark EV, if you have any of those in your fleets, the Cadillac ELR and CT6. Uh, so that it will provide comparable EV data and experience uh, without having to do a go install. So that's really exciting. Uh, uh, the next thing is, uh, for last mile delivery fleets, one of the big pain points we heard is when you discover an EV is not fully charged in the morning. So this results in stranded vehicles, late delays, having to swap out a vehicle. Um, we designed a dashboard that essentially calls out uh, and helps you identify opportunities, especially the overnight staff that are working in the depot, uh, of when a vehicle will not necessarily, is at risk of not being fully charged when it's required in the morning. Okay, so some of the ideas we're toying with. Uh, so may is in, in italics, but may be coming, uh, because these are just ideas that we're experimenting with today. And we're getting feedback, and I'm keen to hear what you guys think about this. Uh, so the first one is EV range. So EV range, typically, historically, we present it as that state of charge percentage. Uh, however, uh, that's, that's not something that translates well for people, especially as you adopt electric vehicles with different battery sizes. That 34% at the top could mean very different things, uh, depending on your battery size, in terms of can it actually go the distance. Uh, so there's a couple different aspects to this. One of them is right now, what is the remaining range on this vehicle? Uh, and it could, be a, a, it could be a variation, because there could be a minute of max. And generally, historically, what is it on a full charge? And having a better idea about what is the distance that this field can, can do looking at the real world conditions in my fleet. So that's one idea, we're getting feedback on it. Uh, the next one is battery health. Uh, so if you're in the last session uh, where Matt announced that we have a battery degradation tool, that is a calculated analysis that's done kind of behind the scenes. Uh, but can we bring that into the fleet so you can look at it specifically for every single vehicle that you have. So what is the battery degradation? Uh, what is the impact on your range? And can we actually bubble up factors that you can, changes that you can make uh, to actually slow it down? Uh, so again, these are mock-ups that are very subject to change and getting feedback on this. Uh, the next one is our charging costs. So Megan talked about how her team uh, went through some experiments to make sure that you could quickly figure out what your charging costs are. Can we bring the same concepts directly into the product, making it really simple for you to enter in what your electricity prices at, are at different locations, and quickly have a compute, uh, calculated value right there in the EV charging report, potentially? Uh, yeah, so those are some of the ideas we're thinking about. But we uh, gave out those forms. If you have any uh, new ideas for us, or if you would like to share any ideas with us, please do not hesitate. 
We're keen to have those conversations. And we want to announce that we do have a customer advisory program. So what this is, is a way for you to opt in to say, hey, I have some ideas. I want to share some information with you about how you can make the product better for me. And uh, product managers, product designers are very keen to reach out directly to you uh, and get your insights on what we could be doing better, how we can shape the product better for you. Uh, so uh, there are cards that you can pick up on your way out with a little bit more information about this program that uh, Mike at the door has. Uh, but just go to geotab.com slash cap and you can quickly sign up for that program. So we're very excited to talk to you about any, any of your EV questions or concerns. All right, uh, with that, I think we're gonna jump into the Q&A. All right. Okay, I think I got this right. All right, so we have one question for us so far, that's great. So can GeoChat provide the customer with predictive information such as the EV battery is showing characteristics that will fail in the next week? Okay, that's great. So that touches a little bit on EV uh, battery health, so we did talk about that. Uh, so that is one idea that we're toying with on whether or not uh, the degradation has gotten so bad that it no longer meets your range needs. Uh, so that is a concept we're, we're playing with as potentially something in the future. Right. Any other questions? Yep, there's one over here. Chuck's got the microphone. As you know, you have a lot of different manufacturers and from our side in Latin America, they are investing in EVs, but from China, mm -hmm. from generics brands. Mm -hmm. So they don't have any standard, but they have a lot of information. For mm -hmm. example, one thing that is very important is the, uh, the proof points of the cell. The, sorry, the proof points? The, of the proof points of the battery. They are built in a lot of cells, and each one of them has voltage, temperature, and the way that they are charging in the process. So they present a lot of fault codes based on the proof points, and that is very important for the diagnostics and support of each EV. Mm -hmm. How we can get that standard information, or you have any standard to how to integrate that data using OBD, because by now we are doing a data link converting the data of each manufacturer from China and converting that, that information into something that Geotab has to understand or can understand. But from the side of fault codes, yeah. we have a huge question related with that. Temperature, each cell, proof points, and performance. Yeah, that, that's a really good question and I'd love to talk to you more about that. I think uh, right now the, the fault codes uh, for me, I would just like to hear the ones that, that you're really interested in, so it's good just to hear what the, your list is. Uh, but yeah, today, we Geotab is really good at getting the fault codes that are come through the standard OBD2 standard, and it's definitely an area where we'd like to be able to improve the product to make sure we're getting the fault codes from EVs that you're really interested in. So if you have any ideas there, please write them down. Please join the customer advisory program. We want to talk, yeah, okay. <laughs> we want to talk to you about that, uh, absolutely. But one thing I'd also like to add is that it's important to keep in mind with EVs, almost nothing has been standard. And so when we're working to figure things out, it's important for us to be able to utilize everything available to us to get the right information in, right? That's been all of our engineering experience. And also it's important for us to have great communication and dialogue, especially with some of the newer OEMs that are making electric vehicles in order to make sure that the information is in a way that can be used for all customers, all partners. Do we have any more questions? Oh, yeah, there's one over there. Yes, Geotab has a lot of experience with kind of traditional vehicles and also it sounds like electric. What are you guys doing to sort of help set those standards? Because kind of everyone has all the same questions and so, taking the first stab at that would be very valuable. 
Absolutely. I think a good answer to that is the J1939, and I'll hand it over to Megan to speak a little bit more about that. So one of the things that we've been doing when we work with uh, specifically medium and heavy-duty EV manufacturers is to advise using a standard that is an extension of J1939. So internally, we have a way to say, you know, here's our communication protocol for J1939 EV. If you adopt it, it means that your vehicle will work immediately with all of Geotab's features, uh, that fleets that are using your vehicles will be able to see the same information that we can see here, charging reports, trip reports, real-time state of charge. Uh, so you don't essentially have the problem of apples to oranges. Yeah. You need, the you need that. Oh, okay. Uh, Megan's team has been working very uh, strongly with uh, OEMs directly to support that standard, and that's good for everybody in the industry. Um, obviously, Geotab uh, can benefit, but any telematics provider can benefit from that. So in cases where um, we're warning about charge problems, we're, mm -hmm. um, you know, having maps that show uh, things that could be problems. Um, how much do you foresee a need to standardize and move towards, you know, from one dashboard the manager can start charging, they can stop charging, they can actually, in the case of vehicle to grid, they can start the bi-directional or change the bi-directional. Is that a future that you're interested in or see coming? Yeah, we definitely see the, the benefits of having an integrated experience. And I would say that the first conversations now are what's the benefit of, a, of an integration with uh, just char charging station operators. We're very interested to have those conversations. Uh, the, I mentioned the EV charging report, for example. Uh, if you have a networked uh, charging infrastructure, you have all that data already there, um, which is great. Uh, the EV charging report will fill the gaps when your vehicle charges outside of that network. Um, but just having, looking at different integrations, what the potential is, Geotab is a very extensible platform. We're very open to having those partnered integrations. And so we're keen to have the conversations. And, you know, we want to hear from you. Like, do you want to have that single dashboard? What can we do for you? So. Again. We work with a lot of customers who do last mile distribution. Mm -hmm. So, as you know, you know in, in EVs, it depends a lot of how many times you start and stop the vehicle. Brakings, accelerations, the way that you do that, the traffic, the average speed. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in Latin America, you have a country, you have cities where in some time frames, the average speed can be around eight kilometers per hour, really mm -hmm. low. So, you have to be stopping and starting the vehicle. And in other time frames, you have to, you can go up to 20 to 25 kilometers per hour inside the city. For example, Bogota or Lima behave like that. Mm -hmm. So when you are showing in GeoTab the expected amount of kilometers that are capable mm -hmm. of doing with that uh, amount of charge, mm -hmm. how you are calculating that? Because mm -hmm. we have to put that into the routing tool and predict if the vehicle is capable to, of doing that depending on the time frame and the average speed of each street based on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's something we're just embarking on now, but we'd want to look at the factors that are contributing to that today. Today, what we do have is the electric energy consumed for your typical trips. So you can look at that vehicle, even just look at the last few weeks, see what is the electric energy consumed that you needed to complete the trips that you described, no matter what. The, you know, terrain differences, speed differences, and all that, it takes already into consideration all those factors. You already have a little bit of a rule of thumb of what, you know, what's your typical range you can get just based on the data we have today. Um, but we would want to take a look at that data and look at what, what's the most accurate value. And different solution ideas, right, are can our big data team have an accurate value? How accurate can that be? And we'd want to do some testing on that. Can we potentially partner with another, you know, integrate in, integration system that already does that prediction for us? And that would be awesome too. Um, can we get the dash value, right? So a lot of EVs do have the, the value of the remaining range on the dash. Can we get that? Uh, in some cases we can, in some cases we may not be able to get it reliably. Um, so there's a, duper, a number of different uh, solution directions we can go there. But I, I'm glad you're, you're raising the fact that there are 
obviously a lot of factors that, that factor into that range that you can get. And yeah. I would say for today, to expand upon Sarah's point about what we already have built in, even if you think about the types of routes that you're doing today that have a lot of start and stop and slow speeds, which is really where EVs shine, they do really well in those conditions, can we look at those routes and say, you know, do a comparison of the efficiency if you have similar vehicles that are deployed in different places? And then we can start to take into account other factors. You know, what was the weather that day and that type of thing. And even just to create uh, a more comfortable or empirical rule of thumb while we are determining the best way to roll out range into the product. OK, great. Um, unless there's any more questions, we're going to break till 1130, which is our next session. So if anybody wants to go for a coffee or something, they can come back. It'd be great.